Welcome to this week's episode of The Gracie Note. I'm here with Canadian filmmaker, director, and writer. Robert Budrow. You have just released today on March 11th, Born to be Blue, the story of Chet Baker starring Ethan Hawke. Can you tell me where it started for you, where the project started for you? I've always loved jazz. Mm -hmm. um, the very first film I did at a film school was a period jazz movie. I became aware of Chet Baker's music many years ago, but it wasn't until I, I kind of really found out about the story in the late 60s when he um, had to form a comeback after losing his teeth that I really became yes. fascinated by, um, by his character and by the themes that I think the, I knew his story um, would allow me to explore mm -hmm. at the time in America, themes of race and, and yes. addiction. And, and so for a lot of reasons, I kind of became captivated by him and sucked in and, and the project kind of evolved from there. Was Ethan Hawke always your Chet Baker? Was he always your leading man? Did you have anyone else in mind or anything? Ethan was always my top choice. I think with these kind of projects, it, it went through a few years of different iterations. And of course I looked at other people. It's, it's okay. always what you do on these movies. But I was really so thankful that Ethan was available mm -hmm. and, and really passionate and interested when we reached out to him and that I was able to work out with him. And was it an intentional choice going with uh, an already known actor versus an unknown? What was important to you? Well, I think Ethan does resemble Chet a mm -hmm. lot in his 40s, and so Ethan does bear a strong resemblance. Mm -hmm. I think the realities of making a movie are that you need to put together financing and you need sure. to actually yes. get it made. And so typically if you have a name that people know, it allows you to put your financing together and get the movie made. Mm -hmm. You don't always have the luxury of casting uh, unknowns yes. in, in roles. And I think... But Ethan was great because creatively he was perfect. I was able to catch him at a time in his career where he's enjoying a bit of a renaissance, uh -huh. coming out, uh, coming off of his Linklater movies, his his, um, you know, the Sunrise trilogy, which they had just completed, and then Boyhood, and, yes, yes. and he was really hitting his stride on all kinds of fronts, and and I caught him at that moment in time, so it was really great. The setup for the film within a film was such an interesting way to. Uh, execute the timeline and and connect the two together. How did uh, how did you decide to represent that? Well, when I s first started looking into the project, I had found out that when he was serving time in Italy in the early '60s, yes, he was approached by Fellini's producer Dino De Laurentiis, mm -hmm. uh, and he offered him Chet to start a movie about himself. Mm -hmm. uh, that movie never happened, but I, I was fascinated by this idea of using that in a almost a Charlie Kaufman kind of way to pretend that the movie happened and using that as, as a jumping off point to kind of tell more of a reimagining. Yes. Uh, yeah. To me, that was one of the reasons that I was attracted to the story in the first place. Artistically, you made choices using uh, black and white or monochrome versus color and different lighting techniques. It must have just to weave the lace of it must have been confusing, but also really, really exciting. It was. I mean, we always want, I always wanted to do a kind of a stylish movie because yes. jazz in the 50s and 60s oh it is goodness. a stylish yeah. world. And I think, you know, the reference for us, at least for the 50s, was William Claxton's beautiful black and white photography. Pretty much mm -hmm. all of the photographs of Chet Baker or other jazz cats that you see in the 50s are black and white. So mm -hmm. for me, it was important to kind of reference that. That's and really it, cool. it also not only allowed us to reference that, but it allowed us to separate the film within a film to the yeah. present day yes. 60s, which which is of course in color. And I think the 60s are an era kind of conducive to color anyways. Mm -hmm. Where was the movie shot majority or little scenes and everything? Where was it filmed? So the, the movie was shot entirely in Sudbury. Wow. In the fall of 2014. Uh, we did a couple days in, in L.A., of mm -hmm. course, in Malibu and Santa Monica, but it was entirely shot in Sudbury. That's so, so everything we see, the studio, everything that's all in Sudbury? Correct. That's very cool. Did you use a real recording studio for it, or was it a set that was built? No, that was basically a community hall that wow. my um, amazing production designer, Aiden LaRue, um, Designed and that was kind of that was that was based on the design of, of Olympic Studios in, in Barnes, uh, London. Which uh, there, there's quite there's a famous film that Godard made, Sympathy for the Devil, The Rolling Stones, where they they recorded the their record there, mm -hmm. and it has a similar color palette in terms of those backdrops. So we kind of referenced that a little bit. Was there anything about what drew you to Chet? And was there anything about his his personality or his life that you wanted to to get out to to showcase. I think Ethan and I talked a lot about just trying to create 
a really multi-dimensional human, yeah. not just a brooding, cool guy, but, but someone who had a sense of humor, someone who, you know, had a temper, who just, you know, a full-rounded human being. And I think what attracted me to Chet Baker in the first place was that he was a character of contradictions. He, you know, he was an Oklahoma farm boy who also happened to be this James Dean of jazz in the big mm -hmm. cities. And, and he... You know, he made his life singing beautiful love songs, but yet in real life he had, he had you know, certain issues trying to deal with, with love in that sense. And so I think, you know, I'm always drawn to characters that have these kind of complexities, and, mm -hmm. and, um, and Chet was no different. The bathtub scene, it was so, uh, you know, it's, it's where passion meets pain and pushing through to the other side and just wanting your... your your talent and your drive more than anything else and it was so hard to watch him in the bathtub and bleeding and and then finding him on the floor later what was that what was that like filming that experience like filming that in the apartment for you to watch Ethan in the bathtub struggle and everything and how did you get direction across in that mm -hmm. moment it's funny because for whatever reason up until that point there had been a lot of fairly light uh, scenes uh -huh. and Ethan was constantly trying to find humor and trying to find lightness and stuff and I think um, I remember talking to Carmen on the day that we did the bathtub scene, and, and I think she was just really shocked at the, at the depth of the darkness that yeah. he had to go to for that, because it was the first time in the shoot, it was around the, mid the midway point of our shoot, that we really dug into kind of more of a rock bottom type of a, a, right. of a time in Chet's life. And so, you know, for the most part, Ethan and I had spent a lot of time together. It wasn't like I had to give him a ton of direction okay. on, on set. I mean, I, I think I was just there to try to create a collaborative environment and push him to try and experiment and you know we, we did try to keep things fairly loose mm -hmm. and I was I, w I was just trying to keep finding kind of moments that weren't planned and some of the stuff in the bathtub what we always wanted to do was capture kind of different layers and different sides of Chet Baker and this mm -hmm. was certainly you know almost kind of like a whiplash moment in that it really showed the determination and struggle and pain that's involved in trying to to, to claw back and I think um and at the end of the day, it's all just about trying to get the actor in the moment, um, you know, being as honest as he can, and, and then just trying to capture that. So I, I, I think, um, it, I, I also knew it was a, like going to be a really important kind of turning point in the movie. Oh my goodness, for sure. When you were researching the movie, did you get a chance to speak with anyone who knew Chet personally? Some of the musicians uh, that played for the movie... Um, a bunch of them played with Chet back in the 80s. That's and so, so I was great. hearing stories while we were recording the soundtrack for the movie. I was hearing stories from uh, the band uh, who had played with Chet. Born to be Blue is going to, uh, well, premieres, as uh, we said in the beginning, on March 11th in Toronto. And then what do you have planned next for yourself after after the Cross Canada premiere dates? Mm -hmm. um, well, after the Canadian release, we're, we're releasing shortly thereafter in the U.S. with oh, IFC wow. Films. And mm -hmm. so I'm going to be in South by Southwest next week. Yes, very cool. Um, and then, you know, the international rollout's going to happen. So, you know, it's going to roll out slowly over the course of the year. And then in the meantime, I'm, I'm working on a couple new projects that I'm developing and trying to put the pieces together. And hopefully I'll maybe be behind the camera this fall or as soon as possible. Thank you so much Thank for, you. for taking the time to talk to The Gracie Note. And right. as we said, you can check out Born to be Blue in theatre starting March 11th. And visit a link in the description to how you can get tickets. As always, be Gracieful. Thanks again and congratulations. Thank you. Bye guys.